Hello everyone, my name is Michael Melzer. I'm an associate researcher uh, at the University of Hawaii's College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, and I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here at this conference. And today I'm going to be discussing some of the management approaches our laboratory is taking towards coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, so coconut rhinoceros beetle, or CRB, Erichthys rhinoceros, a large scarab beetle. Um, the most common life stages that you'll see are the larvae on the bottom, or grubs, uh, and, and then they emerge into the adults, which are the, the more recognized um, version of the insect. Uh, uh, the larvae themselves are actually beneficial. If it was just the larvae, uh, we wouldn't have an issue with this insect, but it's the adults that feed their sap feeders, they feed on the canopy of palm trees and produce this damage, and this damage can actually lead to, to death of the palm tree. Um, CRB was first found in, uh, you know, it's got a native range of, of Asia uh, and started to move into the Pacific into the, uh, in the 1940s, but most concerning was when it moved into uh, Guam in 2007 and then Hawaii in 2013, and this has resulted in the establishment of the Coconut Rhinoceros Beetle Response Program, um, uh, which I'm the principal investigator for, and uh, a lot of great information is available on the CRB website, which is crbhawaii.org and you can find more information there for background. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is development of management tools. And this is one of our biggest issues with, with dealing with coconut rhinoceros beetle is having some additional management tools because this is a relatively understudied insect. And one of the first problems we, we face is identification of infested breeding materials. So if you remember the larvae, they, they, they're fantastic in compost. If they just stayed there and didn't develop into adults, this wouldn't be an issue, but they do develop into adults. Uh, so we need to knock the life cycle stage out at this uh, uh, particular location, which is these breeding sites. And here we can see a large mulch pile that could be um, infested. And what do we do once that's infested? We don't necessarily have a lot of good chemicals we can use or other treatment methods. One of our answers to this is hidden in this, um, uh, this, this trailer here that's tarped up. This is, a, this is a, a custom piece of equipment made in Germany. This what you're seeing is the uh, transport over to Oahu. And what this is, is a uh, mobile vacuum steam unit. And what this is, is a way to rapidly um, heat up materials, including breeding material, uh, so that it can devitalize any life stages that are present. And if you look at the schematics here, what you're looking at is uh, a boiler. Uh, it's got a 150 or 180 kilowatt boiler in it for generating steam. Um, it's got a large vacuum unit for drying a vacuum. And then also it's got a, a large um, treatment chamber where we put materials in for treatment. And the reason that we, we call this diesel and the reason that it's mobile is that because we can take this anywhere and, uh, and we use a, a diesel um, generator. It's a 150 kilowatt diesel generator and that allows us to transport this unit and not have to worry about having a power source. This, this uh, uh, unit requires uh, over 100 amps of energy at 440 volts and that's not often available at most field sites. Uh, so that's why unfortunately we have to uh, use a, a diesel generator to power the unit. So how are we using this unit? Um, we're, we, we received this unit about two years ago or a year and a half. It took a lot of time to get permits in order to actually uh, make it operational. Uh, but our current process is we're, we're taking mulch uh, that you've seen in those piles. We put them in these modified bins that have um, uh, pipes in them that allow steam to, to penetrate the material. Um, those are loaded into the, uh, the chamber that you see here. And on the sidewall, you can see some of these tem temperature probes. And from there, we insert the temperature probes and that allows us to make sure the uh, material is getting up to temperature. Uh, once it's underway, we can monitor all those temperatures so that we can make sure that a minimal temperature is met that, that will kill all the uh, life stages um, and, and uh, continue the treatment. And from there, you can see we can, you know, as we inspect some of the material that's been treated, we find a lot of dead life stages and dead larvae and so forth. And, and so in some ways it's, it's been successful. So what do we want to do with this? Um, well, one of the things we need to do is, is, is concurrently with this research is determine the, the minimum lethal temperature that's required to kill all life stages. And we've previously done that with 24 hour exposures, one hour exposures, and those are more for if we wanted to do composting uh, and sort of, sort of more slow motion methods. Uh, but what the, the MVSU allows us to do is 
rapid um, treatments. And so we want to know what kills, what, what temperature do we need for killing a beetle at 10 degrees or for 10 minutes. And so that's some of the work that we've been doing now with, with determining that temperature. Um, what's that temperature for a 10 minute exposure that we know will kill all the life stages in that material. Um, the other thing we're working on is maximizing the throughput. Um, and that's by either modifying the container bins or um, modifying the, the vacuum and steam per, uh, cycling parameters that occur in this process. And um, our ideal thing, what we want to eventually strive towards, we're not there yet, but we want to strive before um, three cubic yards of material per hour or maybe up to 15 cubic yards per day. Um, and if we can get to that, we can process a lot of that infested material. So very divergent from this diesel powered in this in the field, you know, hot, sweaty type of apparatus. We're also looking at a, a genetic approach for managing CRB. This one's a bit more experimental, but is also showing promise. And this is a, a process called RNA interference. Uh, this is a process that's been, you know, been known for maybe about a decade now and is now going towards pest management um, issues. It's, it's uh, basically it's a process uh, where we target endogenous genes of whatever pest we're after and um, and by targeting those genes and not allowing them to produce protein um, we basically are, are, are uh, killing the the insect at that point and the benefit of this is unlike a synthetic pesticide that doesn't necessarily have um, barriers between species and and, and so forth um, genetic or rna interference um, can be highly specific to a particular insect and not have any cross-contamination or, or cross-activity with other uh, insect species. Um, so that's the benefit and, and again it, it won't benefit or it won't harm things like bees or other things that other uh, the, the pesticides that we're currently using um, has the potential to, to damage. How did we have to do to get established with this RNAi approach? And the first thing was the CRB was reasonably well, uh, reasonably understudied when we first started this project. So we needed to gener uh, generate transcriptome data. Um, we did this through high throughput sequencing of the RNA of a uh, first, first instar larvae. And um, from that, we generated about 30 million reads and, and we found about 15 genes that we wanted to target uh, just because they're either highly expressed or uh, they've been shown to be e efficacious for other insect systems. Um, so these are some of the genes that we decided to target. If it's got a number next to it in brackets, that means we're targeting that gene in different parts of the gene just because we think that's a great target. So these are some of the, we, we basically ended up with 24 different effector molecules that we'd use to target those genes. And uh, from there, we had to modify a, a, a vector um, that creates double-stranded RNA um, to allow us to, to uh, uh, expose to the coconut rhinoceros beetle. And so we did this just by modifying a commercial cloning vector um, so that we can produce double-stranded RNA transcripts um, really quickly uh, and uh, do high throughput screening of, of these transcripts. Uh, so the next step was then, you know, the first thing is now we need to micro-inject CRB. Um, and what we do is we would take um, double-stranded RNAs and inject those into all different life stages. Um, we were using somewhere between 10 to 150 nanograms to do that injection um, per specimen. And then we would monitor them for about two weeks to see if uh, we had any mortality induced by, by these genes. And so the, the, the graphs on the left that we can see here, the figures on the left, these represent um, all the different life stages that we tested, which are first, second, and third star in, uh, larvae, as well as adults. And as you can see from these graphs, um, five of our RNAs or five of our gene targets that we looked at induced um, reasonably high mortality, um, typically up to 100% mortality after a 14-day exposure. All of our control treatments and most of the other genes that we looked at um, there, that didn't impact the mortality. But we five found, found five really good target candidates um, that induced high mortality. Um, and we even did a uh, um, gradient to see from 150 nanograms down to as little as 10 nanograms, which is uh, a very small amount of, of material, especially when you consider, you know, most other pesticides are in the milligram, um, a, a thousand fold more. So this is in the nanograms and, and even down to 10 nanograms, um, this approach was, was, was working. Um, so some of the things that we're currently working on is trying to multiplex these dsRNAs. Unfortunately, it looks like combining different dsRNAs to make them even more lethal is, isn't necessarily effective for this insect system. 
Um, our next biggest hurdle that we're using to adopt this is trying to find, obviously we can't go around in the field and just inject all these beetles. Uh, you know, that's, that's obviously not gonna work. So um, we need to do it through oral delivery. And so we've been looking at different uh, 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 liposomes and, and uh, chitosan and other different nanoparticles for delivering this. So far, those haven't been successful, um, but we're starting to look at other nanostructures for this work. Um, we also, you know, have been showing that we can, these effector molecules, if we say to wanted to inject them in a tree or another plant, in our model systems, we can inject and they do show up um, distal. Um, so, so to conclude for this presentation is we've more or less developed two very disparate approaches um, for managing coconut rhinoceros beetle. One is in use now, the, uh, or at least partially in use, is the mobile vacuum steam unit. Um, the RNAi, uh, it's still at the experimental stage, but that's probably more of a long-term approach. Um, so both of these can, are, are being tailored for the CRB program, but probably the good news is that we can readily adopt these to other biosecurity and invasive, issues, uh, invasive species issues in Hawaii. Um, so with that said, I'd like to acknowledge the Agrosecurity Lab. Here we are on a bowling foray um, and, and basically the CRB response team. And especially uh, thank you for our outreach folks, um, Koki Atchison and Kylie uh, Kosaka for helping with the production of this video, um, as well as our sponsors, which include Hawaii Department of Agriculture, um, Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, or the HIS Group, um, and uh, as well as U.S. sources of funding, which is U.S. Department of Agriculture and U.S. Department of Defense. And thank you very much.